Hello! Welcome to another cozy, chatty paint with me. There's a lot of things I want to talk about this week, so I figured why not just throw them all together in a cauldron of conversation. While we chat, I'll be painting this tasty little sweet shop illustration for my 20 illustrations challenge. This is actually the first illustration I did with my Necker poster colors, and thus was the fall down the rabbit hole. I don't think I've ever been more attached to a set of paints before. I don't know, I'm a big fan of Winsor & Newton, particularly Permanent Yellow Deep, but guys, these paints. <sighs> Anywho, I like them a little bit. <laughs> so earlier this year, I talked about wanting to step out of my comfort zone and try new things, and that included trying new things in my artwork. Some of these things were a lot more extreme than others, like trying to paint scenes that were more cinematic in scale instead of more print-friendly sizes so fairly long paintings. But one of the things I also tried was branching out into different color palettes, which in a roundabout kind of way has actually helped me hone in more on what colors I like using more regularly. After all, how are you gonna know what colors you like if you don't give them all a try? For example, I don't typically reach for purples and blues. I love using a lot of greens and yellows, reds, these kind of warmer, more nature-y colors. But, for some reason, I really felt like this one needed a kind of purpley blue gray accent. So I made a rough color comp digitally just to make sure that I had at least a general idea of what I wanted to do, and I went in on the painting process. And this is where Knicker French Gray enters the chat. This color is a literal chef's kiss. I think I mixed it with a bit of French blue and mauve to get the exact hue I wanted, and I was absolutely in love with how it turned out. It's not a color that I ever really add to my paintings, but for this one, I don't know, it just felt right. <laughs> so one of the questions I get asked a lot is how I create my mixes and how I can recreate a specific mix if I didn't mix enough in the first place or have to come back to a painting on another day. So here's a little tip for the week. Fair warning, it's probably not what anyone wants to hear. <laughs> Practice a lot. And I mean a lot. You can take all the color theory classes you want and learn all you can about the nuances of hue and saturation and value, but if you're not actually practicing mixing those nuances, it's really just not going to make a lick of difference. Practicing mixes is the best way to train your eye to see variations in color and to train your hand to accurately recreate them. So whenever I want to mix a warmer green, I always add either permanent yellow deep or chrome yellow rather than a primary yellow or a lemon yellow. But I never would have discovered how warm this will tint my greens if I hadn't spent a lot of time just mixing a bunch of different paints together. If you want to practice your mixes, I definitely recommend picking out a few scenes from different movies that you'd like to paint. Don't worry too much about fully rendering out the scene, just practice mixing the colors you see. This is really going to help you train your eye and your hand. So one of my biggest goals this year was to get more in tune with my art and find that elusive style that every artist seems to be searching for. But truthfully, the only way I seem to be making any headway with that is by letting go of the process and just listening to my intuition. Style is internal, who knew? <laughs> so simply trying the things that come to mind. Trying a new color, painting a new animal, throwing some line decker esque shapes into fur textures, or cartoon saloon mark making into the trunk of a tree. Which brings me to something that's been noodling around in my head for quite a while now. And that's knowing when to let go of the techniques of your art heroes. Admiring an artist or an animation studio isn't about adopting every element of their style. It's about deciding what you like from them and letting go of what doesn't speak to you. Let me give you an example. I love Chris Hong. Really, Allie? I didn't know. You haven't mentioned that a zillion times or anything. Yes, I love Chris Hong. She's probably my favorite modern artist. And for years, I just wanted to be Chris Hong. I wanted to stylize characters the way she does. I wanted to render faces the way she does. I wanted my art to look like hers. Even throughout this year, as I've been painting some more human characters in my challenge, I wanted to render them out the way that she does. But somewhere along the way, I started realizing that I actually enjoy proportioning my characters a little differently. That I don't really enjoy the process of rendering faces the way she does because it's not my style. It's not in line with my artistic intuition. And when I realized this, I had a little bit of an identity crisis. Who am I if my art doesn't look like hers? And I realized, embarrassingly slowly, mind you, that 
I'm not her. <laughs> Whoa, mind blown. I'm never going to be her, and I don't want to either. I can find the things I like in her work and the techniques she uses that I do enjoy and incorporate them into my own art and let go of the things that don't speak to me. Same with Leindecker. I love the way he uses shapes. Yes, his work is rendered, but there's also a lot of expressive shape language and almost graphic elements to his characters. In a lot of ways, it's actually pretty simplified. So as I've been painting more of the Meraki Meadow characters, I've started to try to develop my own shape language using what I've learned from his. Creating these sort of jagged layers of fur, adding those hatches for a little bit more detail, not making every transition around a form completely seamless, but instead embracing different shapes and brush strokes. Again, not copying him directly, but learning from his style and techniques and incorporating the things that I enjoy. And speaking of the things I enjoy, I went full force into the guilty pleasure art for this illustration. Well, I love painting food. For some psychotic reason, it's really therapeutic for me. I just get lost in the process of painting different textures of breads or the shine of a glaze. Why, you may ask? Who knows? But I really do enjoy it, and I had a blast painting all the little trees in this illustration. For the sweets theme, I knew I wanted to do a pies and pastries shop. I love painting all kinds of foods, but desserts in particular are always my favorite. Honestly, I don't know when the last time I painted food was, other than like the PB&J and the train illustration. Because I've been working so hard on my illustrations challenge for the year, I didn't really make time for the little foodie spreads in my sketchbook. And I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. I set this illustration challenge for myself and made it my biggest artistic priority. But I really did miss painting food, and it was really nice to incorporate it into this illustration. But I did set myself a little bit of a mini challenge for the desserts in this one. Don't over-render everything. So for the cookies on the shelf behind the otter, I added a little bit more detail to the cookies up front and let the others just kind of meld into lost edges. I think both the chocolate chip cookies and the snickerdoodles took me about 15 minutes in total, and I didn't touch them again for the rest of the painting process. I think I spent a little bit longer on the donuts and the eclairs and the pastry case, but I still tried to keep them relatively simple. Trying to give enough information in the desserts directly in view, and let the viewers assume that the things behind them are the same kinds of desserts. One of the things I'm learning this year is that there is such a thing as too much information, at least for my own art. People are smart, and their brains can fill in the gaps of a painting even when the artist hasn't fully rendered an object out. Too much information in one area can quickly pull the viewer's focus away from what you really want them to be looking at. And now, a brief word from our sponsor, me. If you're looking for stocking stuffers for your pals for Christmas, or if you need a personal pick-me-up, then look no further. I have a lot of small items up in my shop at the moment, like sticker sheets, keychains, stickers, or if you're feeling adventurous, then definitely snag a mystery bag. Shipping is available internationally and in the US, so head on over via the link in the description to pick up some cozy items. And now, back to the video. So another thing I've noticed about my gouache painting process is that I really love using thick layers. And now that I have these poster colors, I feel a little bit less guilty painting that way. Now here's the thing, there's no reason to feel guilty in the first place, because the only way you're truly wasting an art supply is if you never use it. That's a fact. But <laughs> I used to feel so bad about using my nice Windsor & Newton gouache because it was more expensive. I would always work in thinner layers because I was afraid if I squeezed out more on my palette, some would be left over and would get scraped in the trash when I was done. Yes, I know gouache reactivates, but sometimes you need the space on your palette and you just wipe off the excess. <laughs> now again, the only way you're truly wasting your paint is to never use it, so there's absolutely no reason I should have been so stingy with my gouache. But I was. So I'm really trying to embrace using thicker mixes because I really do love working that way. Thicker layers take longer to dry, and you can get these really cool effects by working wet gouache into wet gouache. For example, laying down a thick shadow and painting highlights into it while it's wet. I love that. It's so creamy and beautiful. So I'm trying to let go of this guilty mindset about wiping off the excess paint when I need a little bit more space on my palette. Is that a little bit easier since the Knicker paints are cheaper than the Winter & Newton ones? Yes. <laughs> but I'm hoping with a little practice that this guilt-free mindset carries over when I use the more expensive paints as well. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I tend to place way too much moral value on decisions that just don't really matter. 
Now I do this in every area of life, but particularly in my art. Let me give you an example. When I have to repaint a section of an illustration because the values are off or I don't like the hue, I weigh it as a bad decision. Because I'm having to redo it, I must have done it bad in the first place. But bad and wrong are not always the same things. Hear me out. I'm trying to make this separation in my own mind, and I hope by talking to you guys about this, it will help ingrain it a little further in my own mind. So bad has moral value, but wrong doesn't have to have a value. A bad decision is one that hurts you or hurts those around you. A wrong decision may just be one that doesn't have the outcome you wanted. For example, in this illustration, I repainted the cash register. The first pass was wrong. It was too warm, so I repainted it a little bit cooler. That wrong decision got me to the right one in the end. Like we talked about in my video on color theory, color is relative. Sometimes you need to see the wrong color in a situation to figure out what the right color is. But again, this isn't a moral decision. If I'd left the cash register the way it was, it wasn't going to hurt anybody. I just wouldn't have looked the way I wanted it to. So I'm trying to let myself embrace the reality of mistakes in my artwork. To embrace the reality that failure is a very necessary part of the artistic process, but that failing doesn't make you a terrible person or a terrible artist. It just means you're learning just like everybody else. That all of these little failures are just not that deep. So if you, like me, have been putting a lot of moral value on your creative process, stop. It's bad for your health, don't do it. Don't be afraid to make mistakes because they're gonna happen. But just follow your intuition and create. Don't make it any harder than it needs to be. You're not less of an artist when you make the wrong brushstroke or use the wrong color. So I'm hoping this mindset will carry over into other areas of my life as well. I tend to overload my brain with way too much information on what everybody else is doing. How they're exercising, what they eat, how many books they read this year. One of the tragic realities of everybody having their lives on display on social media, or at least a portion of their lives, is that it's very easy to feel like you're not doing enough or you're doing things badly. Again, placing moral value on things that just aren't that deep. So I've discovered this year that I really love Pilates and I really hate running. It doesn't mean I'm a terrible person because I don't enjoy running a marathon. My lungs are crap. A marathon would literally be the end of me. But running is not better than Pilates. We tend to view the classics like Shakespeare and Charles Dickens as being better than YA fiction. We place so much value in decisions and routines that are not one size fits all. That's why there's so many forms of exercise, so everyone can move in a way that challenges and feels good to their body. That's why there's so many books and movies, so we can dive into worlds that speak to us as individuals. If you like animated movies, watch the animated movies. If you love the classics, then read them. There are so many wonderful options out there, and you gotta find the ones that speak to you. Finding your lifestyle is like finding your art style. You have to try a lot of different new things and discover what you do and don't like. And be okay with the things that you do and don't like. And speaking of finding things you like, one of the ways I've been discovering more of my art style this year is by letting other areas of my life have a bigger impact on it. So I've talked a few times on my channel about how I've struggled a lot with burnout over the past few years, and I tried to fix that by developing this very rigid work-life balance which, in theory, is not a bad idea. There's more to life than art, and there's more to me than being an artist. You know, you can't be so caught up in just one thing that you neglect every other area of your life. But I overlooked the fact that creativity is still a really big part of me, and it's intertwined with my life, not just my career. So by treating art simply as work and separating that from the rest of my life, I kind of stopped enjoying anything. So I've been trying to be more intuitive in my creative process and not have so much structure. <laughs> Sketching on the weekends if I want to, even though it's not a work day, or letting an impromptu trip to the frozen yogurt shop inspire a new illustration. So lately, I've been learning about goblin core. Hear me out. Nature, collecting, coziness. We'll break these down in a second and figure out what it means for my art, but the more I've learned about the goblin core aesthetic, the more I'm like, it's, it's me. <laughs> First of all, collecting. I am such a collector. <laughs> I hoard things like a literal dragon. 
but not necessarily useful things, just things that I like. For example, I have quite the little collection of items from going on walks. Lots of little pine cones and acorns, a little squirrel skull. His name is Coven. We got some cool twisty branches. And have you heard about rocks? Whoa, cool stuff. I also love collecting information. I love hyperfixating on fascinating little things like zombie ant fungus and flying frogs and the way our bodies absorb different nutrients. I love collecting things that are interesting to me, whether it's a tangible object or a nugget of information. And the more little things that I learn and collect, the more I can incorporate them into my artwork. Whether that's using one of the cool leaves I've found as a reference for a painting, or using a fun weather fact to paint a pretty sky. Second facet of Goblin Core, nature. Every piece of art I make has some element of nature in it. For the Meriki Meadow pieces, it's a lot of overgrown plants, dried flower bouquets, leaves coming down the walls, or moss on windowsills. A lot of my illustrations also center around sunlight or include little potted plants or, I don't know, mushroom wallpaper. Third facet, coziness. We have known this for a while now. Every piece I make has some sort of cozy vibes. That is my thematic style. I love to paint things that are cozy. They make me feel cozy while I'm painting, and I hope they make the viewer feel cozy when they look at it. So learning more about Goblin Core kind of helps me connect with my art a little bit deeper and incorporate more of the things that I enjoy into it. So by finding what I love in life, my art style starts to blossom too. Finding beauty in folding laundry or reading a book about umbrellas. Because creatives are so tied to their art, it's only natural that your art impacts your life and your life impacts your art. The more I paint plants, the more I look at the shapes of plant leaves on a walk. The more time I spend outside, the more I enjoy painting trees. I'd been so caught up in separating my career as an artist from my life outside of it that I forgot the art part crosses over into both, and that it's okay to let them be connected. The burnout actually got worse because I'd created such rigid boundaries that sucked the joy out of literally everything. <laughs> so whether you're a hobby artist or a professional, you need to recognize that creativity is a part of all of your life, and that's okay. It's not the only part of you, but it affects every part of you. Anywho, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed chatting with me and watching me paint this delicious illustration. Huge thank you to the Cozy Club over on Patreon for making this video possible and for being such a supportive community. Don't forget to check out my shop in the description, and the tools I used for this illustration are down there as well. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you soon. Bye guys!